Well, so in terms of where we are today and, and how we are doing in class right now, um, you guys are just finishing up the homework for Frender. You're practicing multiple activities and libraries and, and uh, you know, landscape and portrait layouts and this kind of stuff. Um, the homework five that's gone up now is focused on data. We've talked about two different ways to gather data. Um, there were REST APIs like web uh, services. And we also talked about local databases with SQL queries. We are going to talk about a third way of accessing data today that's called Firebase. And so then we'll sort of be done with data. I know that might seem like quite a long time to worry ourselves with data, but um, the reason I've chosen to have that much of the course content about data is that I think almost any app or website that matters really is driven by data. And so you have to think about this and you have to know how to access data and you have to think about where the data comes from and where are you going to store it and how are you going to store it. And it's important, so I figure it impo should be important in the class too. Um, so yeah, we'll get into that in a minute. Homework 5 is posted. It is about data. It's called Animal Game. It's actually a variation of a problem I also use in 106 where uh, you have to uh, present the user a yes or no question answering game where uh, you have a database of yes or no questions that you ask them about animals. And if the user says yes, that leads you to another follow-up question. If the user says no, it leads you to a different follow-up question. You could think of it like a binary tree where the yeses are on the left and the noes are on the right. So in fact, I sometimes give it as a binary tree homework assignment in 106. But you can also store all of those questions and all of the answers and references to this one goes to that one. You can store all of that information in a database as well. And so um, we have the data for that game stored as a web API and as an SQL file and as a Firebase database, which I'll talk about today. And so you can sort of pick and choose which way you want to access the data and implement it as an Android app that asks the user to guess animals and stuff. So you can take a look at that later. It's due late next week. Um, so yeah, animal game. You can look at that later. Uh, in terms of our class today, uh, if you take a look at our slides here, I'll just jump straight to them. So we're going to learn about Firebase. And Firebase is a remote cloud database system. So uh, I think it combines some of the benefits of the web APIs that we learned uh, before. And then it also combines some of the benefits of SQL local databases that we learned after that. So I mean, what do you guys think are the relative pros and cons of those previous two systems? Like what's good about the web APIs in terms of you know, what do they do well or what's good about using them? maybe contrasted against the local SQL database? Like, what did you like better about um, the web APIs? What do you think? They seem pretty lightweight, lightweight and easy to use. Pretty easy to use, yeah. You just sort of connect to a URL, you say what data you want, you put in the right format for the URL, and then data comes back and it's not that hard to pick apart the data and use it. Oh yeah, yeah. I would say ease of use, simplicity. You don't have to really set it up. You might have to get a key depending on what API you're using, but like, yeah, you kind of just get up and running very quickly, right? I mean, that's partly because it's not your data, right? Somebody had to do some work, but it wasn't you. So yeah, I, I agree uh, with that. Was that also somebody else had their hand up? What were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say the SQL seemed easier because it came in the table and kind of had like column headers uh, and then rows, whereas the API, you get back this JSON thing that you had to kind of parse through, and it might be that it's like an array inside of a JSON object inside of like some other thing. Yeah, that's interesting. You said the, the structure of how the SQL data was stored was more intuitive to you. Yeah, I think what I found teaching this course, I've, you know, I've done this course a few times where I present these three different ways uh, of doing data, and I find that different students really gravitate toward one or the other. and and there are people who really dislike one and really like another, and it's not sort of a uniform uh, opinion among the students. It's kind of interesting to me. Uh, I grew up with SQL, so in my brain, I sort of think of things that way. But uh, I do think a lot of people like the ease of the web APIs. And so yeah, they both have their pros and cons. Um, the, uh, the other benefits of, what, what about like the benefits of the SQL way over the APIs? What, what can you do with the SQL that's maybe better or improved or something compared to API? Yeah. I mean, you have control of the data, so 
web API can go down and there's not much you can do. Yeah, it's your data. You can do anything you want. You can modify the data. Maybe API won't let you modify the data, or maybe the, only in a limited way. You have full control over the data. You said the web API could go down, so availability. You, in fact, you might not even need an internet connection at all if you use a local database, right? So um, I'm not sure it really comes down to like, which one's better, which one do you like better? I mean, it's like saying, which one's better, a car or a bicycle? I mean. They're both good for certain purposes and not for other purposes, right? That maybe you use one of them more than the other, or maybe you like one of them more than the other, but they're not for the exact same purpose as each other. Um, what about, uh, is there anything else better or worse about SQL compared to the, um, the web APIs? Oh, I have a question. Yeah. So like when it comes to web APIs, can they, is it possible for them to store data in a similar manner as the SQL? Oh, to store it just as a table like SQL does? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the storage of data as JSON is just an informal agreement that all the websites have decided to present the data to you in that way. And they've done that because if it's consistent, then you can just learn a lot about JSON and then you can use that knowledge over and over again. And if everybody invented their own way of storing the data, it would be harder because every time you went to learn a new API, you'd have to figure the format out from scratch. I mean, of course, you still have to figure out what are all the nested arrays of objects going to look like. But at least you sort of know the syntax for how to parse those and how to extract the pieces out of there. Um, you could do something flatter like a table if you wanted to. In fact, there are some web APIs that use an SQL syntax. Um, but you know, just the more standard thing is you submit the URL and you get some JSON back. That's just kind of what's more popular right now. Um, anyway, OK, well, so what we're going to do today, Firebase, is, like I said, it's trying to combine some of the best of both of those other approaches. It's web-based and remote, and so you connect to it in sort of an internet connection way, kind of like you do with APIs. It's based on JSON under the hood, although you don't have to do a lot of JSON to use it. Um, so in those ways, it's like a web API. It also carries some additional benefits, like it's run by Google and it's in the cloud, quote unquote, which means that you know, it's got lots of servers and lots of storage underneath. So if your app suddenly goes viral and you have a million users that you didn't expect, your Firebase database will actually be able to handle that. Whereas if you run your own little dinky server in your parents' basement or something, maybe you can't handle that amount of traffic. So that's cool that it scales well. Um, it's also somewhat similar to SQL in the sense that you can control this data. You can write to it however you see fit. So some of the benefits you were mentioning about local, you can have those here as well. So yeah, um, we talked about where data can live. So this is a remote database. I'm not gonna spend any time on this slide, but um, so uh, if you wanted to set up your own web API, you could set up your own server. You could either buy a computer <laughs> and plug it in somewhere and get it on the internet and connect to it, or you could buy hosting from a hosting company and set up your software on their computer. You, know, you can do this all from scratch if you really wanted to. I'm not gonna teach you how to do that in this course. It's kind of out of scope. Take CS142 if you wanna learn more about web servers. Um, and frankly, most people don't even wanna do this because you then become the administrator and the the um, repairman for this. If it breaks, you know, you have to fix the server. I, I run some web software that runs on servers that I maintain. Like I have a web practicing tool called Code Step by Step, and it's just a server that I run. And if it goes down, I have to go reboot it, you know? And if it goes down at three in the morning, which it sometimes does, because I have some international users, then I have to get out of bed and go reboot the stupid server, and that's actually not very much fun. So most people don't want to do this for themselves, and I'm not going to teach you how to do it uh, for yourselves. So uh, in, yeah, so here, here's why you <laughs> wouldn't want to do it. It costs money. Um, you have to take care of it yourself. It's actually quite hard to run a web service that is secure, that can't get hacked, or that passwords or the data doesn't leak out. You don't want your data to leak out. I mean, all it takes is one leak, and then no one trusts your site ever again. I mean, if you use, what, Venmo or something to send money to each other, and then you discover that like all the Venmo accounts got hacked and all the money got taken out, you only put up with that once and then you're not using Venmo anymore. You know, it's just you, you don't want to have these security problems. Um, and like I said, your server doesn't scale very well. Um, we haven't really talked a lot about performance and scalability or, or most of this stuff. Like security, we certainly haven't talked about that. But um, one computer on the internet cannot handle infinite traffic, obviously. So 
these, there's some limitations if you run your own server. So what people mostly do instead is they use some sort of third party database or hosting of some kind. It's sometimes called backend as a service. Backend would usually be like your data layer or your underneath <coughs> layer that helps power your app. So uh, the most popular backend layer for many years was this thing that Facebook made called Parse and everybody loved it. And so when I first got here to Stanford in 2013, 2014, all the students who did their senior projects and HCI projects and 147 and all these different classes, all of them were using this parse thing to set up their database and it was really popular. And then Facebook decided, wait, we don't make any money on that and everybody's storing tons of gigabytes of data in it. We're wasting a lot of money on all these student projects and so they shut it down. Um, I believe it's still available. It has be been resuscitated as some sort of open source project, but I don't know if it's still good anymore or how it works anymore. So I don't think people are like using it as much. Um, anyway, different companies provide this stuff, like Amazon provides some web services, Google provides some stuff, Microsoft provides its Azure. You guys have probably heard of some of these things, maybe. Um, so, I mean, what kind of things do these companies provide? Well, they provide some sort of data storage or database that you can connect your app to. You sign up for an account. A lot of these things have like a free mode where you can sign up for free and set up your app to store data in there and up to a certain point it's fine and you can do it for free but then if your data gets too big or if you have too many connections per day then they start to want to charge you money and everybody seems okay with this arrangement because it's like hey unless my app literally goes big and gets a million users this will be fine for free but then if it gets big I'll be willing to pay the money because that means my startup is doing well or whatever right so um, that seems to be the business model. And then over a certain amount, you pay a little bit of money per gigabyte or per thousand connections or something like that. And uh, you have to be a little bit careful because, uh, you know, like I used to run an app on the Amazon Web Services and I had a real traffic spike. And then I got a bill for like $175 for one day. And then I reduced my <laughs> settings so I didn't have to do that anymore. But anyway. Um, in terms of, you know, I just said to you a minute ago that these services usually provide you some kind of database. So I guess I wasn't very specific, like what kind of database? How do you connect to it? How does it work? It differs from service to service. Usually they give you some sort of a library that you attach to your app and then the library has objects that you talk to and it connects to the database in the under layers or something. Um, in terms of like what is the data, how does the data get stored? There are some that use like SQL type of stuff, but most of them use something else, they use some sort of JSON based thing where you can sort of store your own JSON artifacts into a collection of some kind. So I'll show you what Firebase does in a minute. Um, these databases that do not use SQL are creatively called no SQL databases. Um, this seems to be like a big fad of like what's popular in terms of data storage in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. Um, I think I have mentioned before that uh, I grew up with SQL everything when I was in college. I was, I was studying computer science kind of right around Y2K. <laughs> so I, I actually was in school when people were freaking out about whether Y2K would be a thing. Spoiler, it was not a thing. But um, anyway, uh, since that time, you know, SQL has become less popular in some spaces and no SQL has become more popular. Um, there's it's hard for me to describe to you exactly what a NoSQL database is because there are many different kinds and it's basically just a database that does not use SQL. <laughs> and it's strange to name something for what it isn't, but I think that should tell you like it was noteworthy at the time for any database not to use SQL. That was how ubiquitous it was, you know? So like that was the best way for these products to explain what they were. They're like, we do not use SQL. And um, there's a whole bunch of these products here that, that are these sorts of databases. I'm kind of curious whether any of you have used any of these products before. I imagine a few of you might have taken 142, and I believe they teach you something like MongoDB in there. Has anybody used any of these kind of products before? Which one have you used? Uh, Neo4j. Neo4j? Okay, okay, cool. What, was that for a project of yours or for a class? Or uh, for Anybody else? Somebody else have there? What did you use? MongoDB. What was that for? Uh, it was, one was for class and one was for work. Okay. And yeah, so I mean, I'm not going to say that these are all the same. There are certain categories or sub, you know, types of these, but um, 
there are some similar properties that they have. And uh, I would say I bolded a few of them that I think are pretty well known that you might have heard of a few of those. MongoDB seems to be kind of a thing that a lot of people use nowadays when they make web servers. But anyway, okay, so fi what's Firebase? That's the point of today's lecture. It is a Google-owned database backend service system. Uh, it was not built by Google, but the startup who made it was bought by Google, and now Google kind of helps with infrastructure so it doesn't run out of servers or something. Um, it's pretty cool. I, I, I would say like if I brought in some marketing person from the Firebase team, what they would say to you is that it's a real-time synchronized database. And what they mean by that is like, you know, in a lot of apps that use this sort of data, it's like many phones, many people talking to one database. And a lot of times when you're doing that, you run into synchronization issues. Like you submit a new, like we're writing a chatting app or a message board app or something. You submit a new message. How is she going to see it? Well, Firebase is really good for that. It's good for like sending out updates. Like, hey, you, I know that you care about this data and this data just got updated. Here you go. And it makes it easy for the different clients to be notified about changes. It's also good at dealing with like, what if two people try to modify the same data at the same time? Like, we don't want to corrupt the data. And so this product is supposed to be good at that. And therefore, they would say it's really good for like big apps with lots of people hammering away at the data all at the same time and looking at it at the same time. Whatever. Um, so what are some features of it? Well, you could use Firebase with um, a lot of different kinds of apps. You can use it in Android apps like we are going to do today. You could also use it with an iPhone app with just a regular desktop program. You can use it with a web app. Uh, has anyone here ever used Firebase before? You have? OK, you too. OK, so was it also with Mongo? You couldn't have used them both together. No, no, no. no. Different projects? when I actually worked at Google. So. Oh. <laughs> Did you work on Firebase? No. Um, it was you're still under NDA, aren't you? <laughs> no, cool. OK, well, anyway, yeah, there, there's lots of companies using Firebase. I think they're working on like a new one. They're, they're constantly rebranding this stuff. So they're, I think in a year, this slide will be called Google Cloud Data Platform or something. They're always, you know, the marketing people are always renaming things to look like they're doing work. But um, anyway, it's, it's a nice system. It provides a lot of cool stuff. I'll show you how to use it. Um, so uh, Firebase. The way I think of Firebase, like the way that I think of the data is that it's all in a giant JSON blob. Or you could think of it as a giant map and the map could contain things inside of it and the things inside of it could also be maps. You could also think of it as a tree. This is a picture of some data. Um, so like a piece of data could have an array with indexes. It could have a Boolean. It could have a number. It could have an object. An object could have fields with values. The fields could be arrays. The fields could be sub-objects. So it's kind of nested in this way. And um, it's actually quite similar to JSON in the sense that like objects are represented with curly braces in JSON. And objects map from keys to values of various types. And an object can contain an object which contains an object. So you can kind of have a nesting. So the way this works is very compatible with the way that JSON's syntax works. And in fact, you can get your data out as JSON, and you can input new data as JSON. So I, I think this is actually implemented in Under the Hood as a big blob of JSON data. Um, so anyway, some sort of hierarchical key value document structure is how this data is stored. It is not stored as tables, I'm sorry. However, you can sometimes map from that mental model to this by having like little subcategories be equivalent to tables and then the sub things inside of those are like the rows of the table and so on. So you, you can think about ways to map these things. Um, so yeah, I wrote it's like a hash map on steroids or it's just a JSON blob on steroids. It can be really big. Um, okay, so uh, I have a couple slides about how to set up Firebase. Maybe before I'll do that, uh, remember I did uh, some slides on SQL where I did some tables and, and databases, and I had a database called Simpsons. And so I want to show you, I have taken that data, and I have put it into Firebase, and I want to show you kind of what it would look like. So um, do you remember, actually, wait, let me, let me do this. I should have done this before. Uh, if I load up the SQL slides, and I go to database example, Simpsons. Okay, so there is 
a Simpson database with four tables, students and teachers and courses and grades, right? Okay, well, how would you represent basically that same data in Firebase or in JSON? Well, you could choose to represent it like this. If you want the students, you could make a student's area, like student's object within the overall data set. And inside there, you could have three or four objects like one, two, three maps to this person, email of Bart and ID of one, two, three, name of Bart, password Bartman. So you could like store each student like that. Now, I guess the thing that might be a little confusing if you're looking at this is like, well, why are the students listed underneath <laughs> these numbers here? Um, do you have any idea like why the one, two, three leads to the Bard and the 404 leads to Ralph. I mean, those are their IDs, right? But like, why, why is it stored that way? And why isn't like this thing here? Why doesn't this say Ralph or something? Like, why does it have the IDs used as the header above them or the parent of them or something like that? What do you think? Are you gonna use one, two, three, four, zero, four, four, five, six, all of these in other, what you can say as tables? Like refer to them there? Yeah, I think I, I think you're right. Like the spirit of an ID is it's supposed to be sort of a unique label for a piece of data. And so if you're going to have this tree, you want to give each of them a name or something. This is a key value storage. So each like value being an object of data has to have a key that it's associated with. Mm -hmm. And so if I associated like Bart with the object about Bart, I would never be allowed to have another student with that same key. So you sort of want to have a unique label for each object of data. And you're right that like sometimes we use the IDs for searching or for matching this table to that table or whatever. And so I just think that sort of uniqueness aspect of IDs is why these things are stored with those IDs as their like key, you might say. So that's like the table, if you will, of the students. So what I, I mean, I'm kind of like you, Alex. I think of the tables, you know. So I think of like this thing as the database, although it's really just a JSON object with the key of Simpsons. And then I think of this as the student's table, although it's really the student's object. And I think of it as like, this is the, uh, these are the IDs. It's like there are, the, these are columns and their values, but really it's just key value pairs in a JSON tree or something. So then like, if I wanna see, um, courses, it's pretty similar, right? The courses have IDs and names and teacher numbers. And so the courses are pretty similar to the students. Um, the teachers are also pretty similar. Teacher ID number one, two, three, four has the name of Ms. Krabappel. She teaches grade four. I, I don't remember, I might've added this, like what grade do they teach to the database? But so that's kind of how the teacher data works. The one that's maybe the weirdest is the grades table. If you look at the original SQL, the grade one, do you remember the grade ones, the, um, the data there, as you mentioned, was like kind of using the IDs to reference the data from the other places in the data set. So I would say one, two, three, took class number 10,001 and got a B minus. That means Bart took computer science 142 and got a B minus. So if you're gonna represent that data you can certainly represent that in the same way in Firebase, except one thing you'll notice is that this table does not have its own ID numbers, right? Like this row, it stores IDs, but it's not the ID of that row in that table. It's a, like an external reference to an ID in some other table. We sometimes call IDs that are about you a key or a primary key, and we call an ID that's a reference to somebody else, we call that a foreign key. So, I mean, that's database terminology, but like, you know, Bart being ID number one, two, three, that's like Bart's key, that's his primary key, that's about him. But this table having one, two, three in it, that is not a primary key for that table. It's a reference to some other table's primary key. So in the context of grades, that number one, two, three is a foreign key. But okay, so these rows here don't have any particular key column to them. So if you wanted to say, hey, look at that row right there, there's no concise way to refer to that row. Do you know what I mean? You can't say row number three or whatever, because it's not in the data. So if you just sort of have it like that, it's implicitly almost like an array where this is zero, one, and two, you know, that sort of thing. And so how you represent that in Firebase is you basically store them with gibberish keys. <laughs> 
like blah 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 maps to the first grade record and blah 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 maps to the next grade record and you might say what the heck what are these long <laughs> strings here and that's Firebase's way of saying the keys don't really matter they don't mean anything so uh, don't worry about the actual strings of those keys you can basically say to Firebase like I want all of them or I want the ones that have a student ID number of whatever and it'll filter and find those ones for you and the, the actual rows themselves you could just have labeled these zero and one and two and three and four and I think the reason they don't do that is because they don't want you to think of the numbers as being meaningful they want you to just think of them all as being in there somewhere yeah so for Firebase are the keys not like hash slash are they like faster than like just a normal SQL database um, are the keys not hashed? I guess, I guess I'm not sure what you mean. Like you, you certainly, if you say I want to look this up by this key, it has optimizations to quickly jump to there. So, so it's it some sort of indexed or hashed thing. I don't know exactly what their is internal it structure is. Than, like, oh, is it faster? Um, that's a good question. I don't actually have a benchmark or anything, but I think um, it kind of depends what you're doing. Uh, I think they're both super duper fast for jumping to a specific piece of data based on an ID. You're like, I want the student with the ID number one, two, three. They both can just like laser fast jump to that place. It starts to get interesting when you say, well, I want all of the students who took both Ms. Krabappel's class and Mr. Hoover's class and who got at least a C plus in each of them. Which one's faster? Then it starts to depend because like how you say that is very different in Firebase than how you say that in SQL. Um, the sort of short version is that Firebase tends to return quickly from each query, but the kinds of queries it supports are less universal than SQL. So in SQL, you can write out a really complicated query, and that one query will give you back exactly what you're looking for. But it might take a slightly bit longer. In Firebase, you might have to issue two or three queries and then if else and compare them a little bit, but each of those two queries would go quickly or something. So it tends to be fast, but maybe slightly less universally powerful than SQL, if you want to summarize. Anyway, th this is me trying to take that database and turn it into a Firebase or into a JSON. Now, I was asking about some of these other products earlier, like MongoDB. If I were doing a MongoDB, it might look like this as well. It might not have this exact web user interface for me to look at it, but like it would probably be a MongoDB basically stores JSON blobs. So I would basically store this as some sort of big blob of JSON and say, here, Mongo, <laughs> store this for me. Yeah. Is this, is this what like dating apps use, for example, to store people's profiles and like their interactions with other users? Would you use this? Really into the dating apps today. Uh, <laughs> no, um, it's, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, different companies do different stuff. Like, it kind of, frankly, it probably just depends most on when the app was created. So like, probably plenty of fish and OkCupid are using SQL databases because they're older. But like Tinder, Grindr, whatever, the other Bumble, is that a new one, Bumble? I haven't been dating for a while, so I kind of, I have to live vicariously through all of you young people. But um, yeah, uh, those might have something more like this. Uh, it's not to say that this is inherently better for an app like that or, or worse. It's just sort of like what software stack was popular at the time that the people built it, you know, frankly. Um, but I mean, I do think this sort of thing does scale well to an app like that that has lots of users. Like you could look people up based on preferences or based on whatever you want. So, okay. Uh, any other questions about like this data and what it looks like and kind of what, what is in a Firebase kind of from a data standpoint? How do you find the students that you want? Oh, well, so, okay, I, I'm going to show you a bunch of, like, Kotlin code you can use to query this or to send new data to modify this. Certainly that would be one way we could do this. But just, you know, I'm in the website of Firebase. This is, like, I set up this database, so I have the access to administer this, and they have this nice web user interface for me to look at it like this. And I actually could add new data here if I wanted to. I, I'm pretty sure I could click, like, new student key is 999 and the value is, uh, let's see, how do I, so I, then I would say like email marty at uh, martystep.com and then, uh, you know what I mean, like I could, I could add something, ID 999, uh, name marty 
and then uh, password teacher. I don't know, whatever, add. So now like I'm in there. Now that's not how you, if you were like running a website or an app or something, and you said, oh, you want to sign up for our dating service? Hold on, I'll go edit the Firebase. Like this is me like debugging and hacking. Like what you would really be doing is you'd have a app or a website that would connect to this and issue commands to add things. But, but you can just as a exercise, you can look at the data here in their little web site, which is kind of cool. Any other questions? Yeah. You were doing all those interesting things with SQL, such as you know using that ID to summon the grades of that person in a particular class and all that. How can you do that here? Well, I'll have to show you. Give me a couple more slides and I'll show you. But I think the idea is like here is the data, and there will be code that I can write that says I want to look for the data in this part of the JSON territory, and I want the ones that have this ID, or have this letter, or have this name, this grade, etc. So I, I'll show you the equivalent commands uh, right now in a moment. I'll show you how to do it. Uh, okay, so it's kind of a big hash map. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides. I have a couple of slides on how do you set up Firebase. I mean, you go to their website, you make an account. I found just pro tip that um, a lot of Stanford students who try to go set this up, it doesn't work and it says like your account doesn't have access or something. I think that's because you guys have Stanford email accounts that are given sort of Google account access because of your web mail is like done through Google or something. So Google like thinks you're logged into your Google account but you're really logged into your Stanford. So I think what you have to do is like log out your Stanford account and log in as a Gmail account or get a Gmail account and then go to this page and I'm actually not even positive that that thing I just described is still a problem, but it was a problem a year ago. I can't replicate this problem, but for you guys, that might be something that you see. But um, anyway, you log in with your Gmail account, you get in there and you say, I wanna make Firebase. And you tell them a little bit of information about the project you're working on, and then it, it kind of goes from there. So then in Android Studio, built into the user interface of Android Studio, they have an option that's like, I want Firebase. So you can actually go to your project and it's under Tools Firebase. <laughs> so if you click on this, it has like kind of a little wizard. I don't know if it's doing it. You can say, well, what do you want? I want a real-time database. Okay, and you could, you can click here and then it jumps you to some URL. I'm not gonna walk through that entirely because I kind of already had to do it to be ready for today and I can't undo it to redo it. So like it's already set up for me, but that's sort of where you would start. and. I apologize that I'm not really giving you a great walkthrough tutorial of how to set this up, but I think what you would find is that the pages would sort of tell you what to do and you could ask us if you got stuck on it or whatever. But you, you set it up, you get your project kind of connected to it. Um, you have to put some stuff in your project settings. And to be honest, it's sort of a pain in the ass. Uh, you know how when you add libraries to a project, you have to edit your build file? We have to add like a million things to these stupid build files or else it doesn't work. And the frustrating thing is that if you get this a little bit wrong, it sort of just like quietly fails and doesn't work on you, bless you. So um, this is annoying. And, and so like I've, I've learned my lesson. The last time I taught this class, I really wanted to replicate the experience. So I like deleted my Firebase account. I made a completely virgin project and I walked in and I tried to like do all of this part in class to show you how to do it. And I'm not doing that this time <laughs> because there's like 20 different ways it can break and it's really detail oriented. And uh, that might be an argument for especially why I should show you how to do it. But I think what it really turned into was watch Marty not have his Firebase working when you know later I would figure it out and get it to work. But um, so like you go to your build.gradle uh, here and you have to add these lines about these Google Play services that allow you to connect to googly things. Um, then you have to add some lines about the Firebase library itself. And then down at the bottom, you have to write this line as well. I will post all these files after class so you can look at them. I already did this. Then you have to go to this other build.gradle. See how there's two build.gradles? You have to go to the other one and you have to put this thing in there too. Just carefully so or else it doesn't work. And then uh, there's a little more as well. There's another file uh, that uh, is called um, Google services.json that you have to put in your project somewhere in the right spot. But if you go through that wizard that I had on the last slide, it does that for you. It, it, this stuff is real picky. So 
I would say the best way for you to do this if you want to use Firebase is to just walk through this and get stuck and I'll help you and we'll get you unstuck. But um, I will say, I, I think that the, um, I guess I didn't really frame for you like, what do I think of Firebase? And I, I think what I would say is that what it gives you is really, really cool. A fast, free, super scalable, powerful database that you can have someone else manage for you, backed by Google's big muscles. That's cool. The price you pay is that it's sort of shitty to set it up and it can break, but that's okay. Like maybe it's worth that price. So anyway, um, you get it attached to your project, you get it set up. Let's actually look at some Kotlin code, okay? You have to initialize Firebase somewhere at the start of your app. Usually the first activity that pops up that gets created, you say Firebase app, initialize app, this. You pass your activity, this. Then to actually search for some data, you get an access to a Firebase database object, which I called FB. Um, you write Firebase database get instance dot reference. That object is like a way of querying the database. So you say, hey, Firebase, I want to access the dot child with a certain name or, or, or path. So let me talk about these paths for a second. Uh, is that on the next slide? Where is it? Uh, OK, so let me, let me show you this Simpson thing here. So imagine that um, I want to, you know, modify Bart's email address. He is no longer at fox.com. He has switched to uh, fake news msnbc.com. Now I can change it in here, but that I want to do it through the Kotlin code or whatever. So the way that you refer, like if you want to talk to this piece of the data, you write out its path down the tree. So it's in the overall database, which is named Simpsons. And within that, it's in the area called students. And within that, it's in the area numbered one, two, three. And then within that, it's in the key called email. So like if you wanted to set the value of that, you could say, uh, and I'll actually do this proper in a minute, but you'd say you have that FB object. You would say FB.child. And in here, you write a string representing the path down the tree that you want to walk. So you'd say like Simpsons slash students slash one, two, three. And if you want the email field, you could say slash email. And then that gives you like a new object that's like a reference to this bucket of string data storage here. If you wanted to set it to something else, you could say like dot set value to be uh, Sorry, I'm trying to indent this over. It set value to be bart at msnbc.com. Like that line of code would connect to the database and walk all the way down, and it would set the email to be that. Okay? That's sort of the general idea here. Um, you can also do things like fb.childsimpsons, and that's like the entirety of all of this. Or you could say fb.childsimpson slash students, bless you. And that's like sort of a representation of all of this. You know, you could like grab which chunk or whatever part of the data. So like if you like to think of the data as tables, I could say something like val student table equals fb.childsimpson slash students. And then I could say, hey, student table, uh, I want your child named one, two, three slash email, you know what I mean? Like you can sort of, each of these like slashy levels down the tree is another child and you can keep going down, 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 child, child, child to get to the part in the tree that you want to set. Does that sort of kind of make sense? Um, that's not so bad, but what's really unfortunate, this is the part where I, I sort of take issue <laughs> with Firebase. Um, what if you want to retrieve the value? I wrote set first. It's weird that I started with modification, right? Normally, first thing is you want to look at the data. Maybe later you want to modify the data. I started with modification because it's easier. You can literally write that code. It will send a message to the database. It will change the email address. If you want to get the value of the email, <laughs> you would imagine that maybe you could do something like you know, val email equals student table dot child dot get value, right? I mean, like, if setting the value is called set value, 
then surely getting the value would be called get value, right? Um, no, <laughs> it is not. And it's not just called something else like retrieve. No, that's not where I'm going with this. It's not the name. The problem is that the data isn't stored on your phone. The data is stored off in Google land somewhere, right? Now, of course, you can connect to there and ask for the data and it'll come back, but that might take a little while. It hopefully won't take very long if your phone is fast and if you're not on Stanford Wi-Fi and you're not in the Huang basement or wherever you get bad signal, but it might take a while, right? And so Firebase is designed to think about that issue, the latency, the lag, the delay to get the data back. So you don't just say get value or retrieve value, because if that were the case, you know, in order for this function to like return the value out, this would have to like block and halt your app right there on that line of code. And that would mean like if you were pressing a button, your app would just freeze until the data had come back and you wouldn't be able to like scroll the screen or nothing else on the screen would update. The app would just like lock up until this data came back, however long that took. And that's just not a good user experience. Um, we haven't talked very much about like latency, uh, you know, and we haven't talked about normally what you do for something like this is like you, you use concurrency, use a thread or something. And I just I haven't talked about that yet, but this library is built with some sort of threading in mind where instead you sort of say, I'll show you how in just a second, but you basically say, I would like to go get this value. And when the value is ready, here, please call this function to, to alert me that it's ready. It's called a callback function, right? So if you've done web dev or some other kinds of development, that's not the most weird thing in the world. But I think the way you have to set this up is a little ickier than I would like for it to be. Um, so let me show you a little bit of how that works. So here's some of the different methods that you can do in a database, uh, in Firebase. I showed you how to get a child and I showed you how to set the value of a child. You can also remove something, you can push a new child that didn't exist before, you can, you know, you, there's a lot of different things that you can do, and I'm not gonna walk through all of them. But um, let me, here, so I think this slide is kind of showing similar stuff, right? Like, if you get the Simpsons slash students, I called that table, because in my head it was like the SQL table of the students. And then if I say, hey, I want the child one, two, three, that's the Bart object here. That's like all, that child one, two, three represents all of this stuff. And then I can say, hey, set the ID to whatever, set the name to whatever. I'm, I'm setting them to what they already are right there just to be consistent, but like I could change them kind of like I did here in my uh, editor. Um, you could also take some other child and set their values to something different, right? Okay, that's not so bad. Uh, da, 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 da. If you if you want to add a new child, remember that weird grade table that had those gibberish um, keys. If you want to add a new grade record, how do I get a gibberish key? Well, if you say, "Hey, grades table Simpson slash grades," that's what that table variable represents. If I say table dot push, it makes a new key and it returns an object that's representing that key, so I could add children underneath it. So I say, hey, push a new record, and then in that record, set its child of this to have that value, set its child of this to have that value, set its child of this to have that value. So that would be how you would like write new data. So you asked me a few minutes ago, like, how do I put new data in there? How do I talk to the, this is kind of how you write new data into a, into a table. Okay. So again, push specifically makes a child with a gibberish key that's meant to be more like for a list of things that the indexes are not keys themselves. Okay, well that's writing data. Um, wait, I'll come back to that slide. Where it gets interesting is when you want to retrieve data. This is the part that I find just offensive. <laughs> I, if you want the data, like if you want to know what is Bart's name or email address or something, you say, hey, I want the data from this part of the database, from the Simpson area, go to the student area, then go to one, two, three, that's this. So go get that. But, but if you just say val bar equals that, the, the thing I think is confusing about Firebase is like, this object, what is this? It's called a um, database reference object. It represents, it refers to that place in the data. But crucially, it doesn't actually have the data in it. It doesn't know the string bart at fox.com or bartman. 
this object doesn't know what those values are. It just, it's almost like, imagine it's all blurry. The database knows that there's something there, but it hasn't connected to the server to know what it is yet, okay? So that's what this thing means. If you want to actually go get the data out of there, you have to call this method named add value event listener, and you have to pass this gibberishy thing that has a method called on data change. This method will be called when the data has come back to your computer. So when you say add value event listener, you're kind of saying, I want to listen to find out the value of Bart, of that part of the database. So you, this is the moment where you initiate a connection to go download something. And when the download is finished of that data, it will call this function on you. And so whatever you want to do with that data, go ahead. Now, the data comes back as a different kind of object called a data snapshot, which is basically like a, it's a lot like the JSON objects we dealt with where you have keys and values and stuff, but you can look at the data that way. So I don't like this. Oh, but also scrolling off the slide because the code is so long. You also have to put in a function of what to do if the data request gets canceled, which almost never happens, so I almost always leave this blank. Ugh, right? I don't like this. I wish they didn't make it so complicated. But um, let's do a quick example. Um, I'm writing data. I'm writing code to deal with this data about Simpsons. So here's what I kind of actually wanted to write with this. I would pick something simple. Let's have an app with a login page, and then once you log in, you can check your grades. So it's like slightly improved version of Access. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> well, so like front page is a login activity. It has a, a name and a password field. So if you type in Bart and Bartman, I want to log you in as Bart. If you type Bart but not Bartman, I'll say that's the wrong password or something, right? So once you get logged in as Bart, I want to say, hey, Bart, here's all the grades for you. Um, you, Bart, have ID number 123, and therefore um, you took uh, this course and got a B minus. You also took this other course and got a C or whatever other, you know, because that's what I want to show you. Once you have logged in, I want to show you your grades, okay? So let's just play with Firebase for a minute. If you go to the app, I zipped this, I put this on the class website if you want to download this, but there's a login activity. Um, the login activity looks like that. Just name and password and login. So those are two like edit text uh, boxes right there. And um, when you click that login button, it, so I already pasted in the code to like log in to Firebase, but I didn't do any of the querying. So when you click the button to log in, I'll go get the name and the password that they typed, and now we have to do the rest, okay? So, uh, help me out a little bit here. Like, uh, what are what are some of the kinds of things I need to start doing here? Like, what data do I want from Firebase right now? list of all users. So, okay, so if I want to get all the users, um, you first have to get an object to talk to Firebase. So, Firebase, this is from the slide, Firebase database dot get instance dot reference. So, that's like the actual object that you can use to ask Firebase questions. So, now typically uh, you ask for the child from Firebase at some given path or something, right? So where in the data set is going to have the stuff that I'm looking for? Like what sort of string do I want to write as the um, path here? Students. Students, right. So I do have to write Simpsons, even though that's like kind of the overall heading. I have to say Simpsons slash students slash now you said get all the students in theory I want the one student like if they said Bart I want that student and then I want to see if that student has that password but that also implies that there is a student named Bart what if they typed you know poo poo and there's no student named poo poo <laughs> like there won't be a student for that so I also it seems like there's something missing here because it's kind of like I don't know you know the next thing here is supposed to be the ID number of the student like if it's student number one, two, three, 
but I don't know what ID number it is because like I don't know you know right it's it's, it's not clear how do I get just this student if there is one so I'll come to that in a second but um, th that's like let's for just a moment assume that I know who I'm searching for so let's assume that I'm searching for person one two three so that's gonna be Bart is equal to that right so now that Bart object like I said does not know the actual data it doesn't know his name it doesn't know his email address so if I want those things I have to go fetch them from the server right so then I'll say Bart dot add value event listener and then if I hit shift control space it lets me fill in this as like a template or something I mean look at this poop <laughs> look at this so then it's like on cancel I'll just leave this empty um, I'll call this data so this function here gets called when the data arrives so this data snapshot thing has the actual data in it that's the thing that's confusing right Bart doesn't have the data Bart allows me to go fetch the data and then the data gets here so like what is the data well it's probably some kind of thing with like you know name maps to Bart and email maps to Bart at Fox.com etc so like if you want these different pieces out of there like if you wanted the name of the person you could do like Val uh, his name equals data dot child name dot get value or I guess you just say value remember how I said there was a set value but there wasn't a get value right this thing doesn't have a get value this thing does because now I have actually downloaded the data this thing does have a get value method or a value property okay so then that's the name you know Val his password is data dot child password dot value so if I want to know whether the person has the right password I just want to know whether the one you typed here matches the one you typed here right and, and I'm fudging it a little because I assumed that the person in question is mr. 123 which is Bart that's not right but I will fix that in a minute so I mean basically you just want some sort of like if the password you typed equals his password then yay I want to log in or I am logged in uh, else wrong you know so maybe if it's incorrect I'll say uh, toast make text uh, this comma um, wrong comma toast dot length uh, length short dot show <laughs> let's let's do the most horrible thing ever let's say wrong the password should have been his password so it'll be like no Bart's password isn't hello it's uh, it's just, you know Bartman or whatever. Um, it's mad because it's it this is is wrong here. Um, I uh, here let me what I like to do. So I don't like all this nesting of all these braces and stuff. So what I usually like to do is I like to write a private fun called like process the data, and I'll take a data snapshot parameter, and then here I'll just you know say. Uh, process data data so I just it gets me out of all this curly brace hell and just gets me down here where it's a little cleaner uh, that works better also because now this is the activity again but okay do you understand so uh, if the password is correct I'm supposed to now um, show the grades of this person right I mean I logged in successfully so how do I do that like what's the app do at this point do you know I mean I know this code you didn't see all of it in detail but like in general what do I do in the app now if you logged in correctly the yeah the other activity is the look at the grades activity this one here is the login so like if you're thinking I need to query again and get grades here no 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 let's jump to the other activity that's gonna do that we haven't written that code yet but the grades activity there's not a lot of code here but I want to know the student's ID and the student's name as intent parameters named ID and name okay so like over here 
I'll make an intent. Val my intent equals an intent that goes to the grades activity, right? And then uh, my intent, I'll put some extras in here, a little something extra in the activity for you. The ID is the ID of, I guess we're currently using one, two, three, and uh, the name is the name that the person typed up above in the, in the, um, oh, I guess I don't have that. So how about uh, name string? I need a parameter for that. So I'll say name data, fine. Okay, so then I'll, I have my intent and I'll say start activity with that intent, right? So yay, logged in, go to grades activity. Okay, awesome. So let's try that. Now, <laughs> it's not usually very likely that we will succeed on the first try. So I really want to stress whenever you're downloading data and stuff like this, please just print the data first. <laughs> you might have the wrong data or you might be not connecting properly. Just print the data. So how about here when this comes back, I will say log.d marty uh, the data is dollar data. Okay, just let's look what data we got. Uh, I will now run the app. We'll see what we get. Clear. I've given this lecture where Firebase just decided to go to sleep for the day and nothing worked. And I've given the lecture where everything worked magically and then the students got mad because when they tried to do it, sometimes it didn't work and they thought it would be easier than it was. So I've seen everything with this shit. But um, let's see what happens today. So let's type in Bart password hello, which is wrong. So I submit. It says wrong. <laughs> the password should have been Bartman. Oh, oops, sorry. Uh, clearly a trained security professional wrote this app. But the fact that it knows that the password should be Bartman means that it got to the database. I'm very happy to see this insecure, unsecure code. I will type B-A-R-T-M-A-N. I will click login. And it, wait, I type Bartman, right? You can't really see B-A-R-T-M-A-N. Login. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I want. Uh, you have to two string maybe the value. Wait. What's password? There's no password here. <laughs> oh, weird. It's like the widget. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, so I'm confused because um, there's a variable called password up here. See how it's gray? It says this is never used. So it's not using that down here because it's out of scope. It's using the fact that this widget has like r.id.pass. It's like using that variable. So, okay, okay. So name, uh, password, string. So uh, this should be name password data, whatever. So just now that password from the actual widget is going to go down to here. Okay, that should work. Um, where am I? By the way, if you're, if you're looking down here, see how it says the data is, oops, it went away. You'll see it again in a second. Um, those log statements are really helpful because then I can kind of see if I'm getting back the data I thought. I would say the most common mistake people have is they're sort of off by a level. They think like my data dot child foo is the right thing, but really it's like my data dot child something dot my child foo. They're like off by a level of brackets or braces or it's one more level in or one less level in. You know what I mean? They're kind of off by one. Um, so if I type Bart and B-A-R-T-M-A-N, Bart man, log in. It goes to the next activity. That's a great start. It just doesn't show Bart's grades yet. Okay, so we got a couple more things we need to fix. Like for one, we hacked this and we hard coded in that the ID number was one, two, three. The other thing is even when we do get logged in, I wanna show Bart's grades over here, right? So let's learn a little more so that we can do that before we get out of here. Um, so if I go back to the slides, I, I think the problem so far is like, 
Implicit in data and databases is the notion that you would want to query. And this is not really querying per se. I mean, it's only a very simple query, like a go get me the record with this exact ID number or this exact path. Certainly you sometimes do that query in a database. Select a student's, select star from students where the ID is uh, one, two, three. That's basically what we did there. But usually the query is more complicated than that. Select the ones with the name Bart. Select the ones with the grade of A minus through C plus or whatever. So I haven't shown you how to do that. So let me show you. Do, 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 do. Um, here, so uh, let me get the right font size here. When you ask for some child, instead of just going and fetching that, you can call these methods on it like order by or dot start dot end dot equal to, and those methods are basically meant to help you sort of group and prune and filter out the results that come back. So. I'll show you this in a second in the, in the project, but basically, if you want the students who have ID numbers of at least 500, I've written as a comment, like what would the query be in SQL? Give me all students where ID is greater than 500. You can say, hey, um, students, order by your key, which is the ID headers up here, and then within that, please start at the value 500, and then go get the value listener for that. Or you can say, well, I want the students who have a name that starts with a B. You can say, students order by name, start at B, end at B, Z, it's kind of a hack to go B through C. Um, so are, there are these methods that you can use. Now, how do I know what those methods are? Well, I mean, there's documentation for this. The methods that exist in Firebase are here. This is a subset of them. There's start at, end at, order by, limit, equal to. So um, I think what you'll find is, if you're used to thinking of things as SQL, you could sort of maybe start with what SQL you want to write, and you can probably find a method that's kind of equivalent to that here. Not 100% of the time, but if you don't find a method that's equivalent, you can sort of like go get the query and then loop over it with some Kotlin code to do the rest, you know? Um, and I would say, even though this does not replicate all of SQL, I don't think that's an error on their part. Like, they're trying to provide a sort of minimal set of queries you can do. Give me all the records in this range, or give me all the records that match this criterion. And that's kind of how they've chosen to present this. So if you want to get the record about BART, so if I go back here, instead of saying Simpsons students one, two, three, maybe you would say, wait, 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 let's not try to get BART. Let's get all the students. And then if you want to trim it down, to the information about BART, maybe you'd say students dot, let's order all the students. What do we want to order them by if we want BART? I mean, I guess the question is, in this data here, which portion of this are we searching for? Are we searching for an ID, a name, an email, or what? name. Yeah, so the two things the user typed are the name and the password. So either we should search for all the accounts with the name of Bart, or we should search for all the accounts with the password of Bartman. Now, I think, as you say, we want to search for the one by name, because if you search for all the accounts with the password of Bartman, maybe you type uh, Marty and Bartman, but then Bart's account has a password, Bartman. It shouldn't let me in. You know, like, so, so what you want to do is you want to order by the child called name, and then within that subset, you only want the records that are dot equal to the name that the person typed in. So that this will be a database reference object that is about BART. Yeah? Am I allowed to have two students named BART then this set? Or will it return both of them? It could return both of them, right? If, if, it were, if there's more than one. So, so the data that's going to come back Sometimes I like to write in my comment, like, what's the data here? Or didn't I do that down here? Yeah. So it used to be that the data that we were going to get back was basically that. But now the data is basically going to be an array with however many results it finds. So it's going to be more like that. OK? And in theory, there could be some other guy with the name Bart and the email, you know, Bart2 or whatever. Um, 
I'm, I guess in this case, I know that there's not going to be a duplicate. Maybe my app doesn't allow that or something. But if there were more than one account with the name of Bart, they would both come back in the results. And the fact that there could be more than one, the fact that it sends them back like this, does mean that I need to get inside of that array. Like the code I have written is not built to handle the fact that there's an array in, in the data. So what I really need to do here to modify this, I believe, is I need to say, uh, Val, so I mean, the data is really more of an array, like I'll call it ARR for array. The actual data that I want is the array dot children dot iterator dot next or something. Like, give me the first kid. There's no easy way to say, like, go in here and get me the first thing in here. But that's kind of like the first child of this. And now all the rest of this code should work OK. Um, anyway, that's, I think that's a little bit confusing. But this up here is the main change, that now I've gone and gotten the, um, the data that actually corresponds to Bart, rather than just assuming the ID number of 1, 2, 3. Um, <clears throat> so there is one issue here. Is like, what if I type in uh, you know, Quijibo or some word that isn't, there is no student with that name. What's going to happen? Well, think about it for a second. The data in that case would come back as like that, empty array. So this here would fail because there are no children to go get the first or next one of. So I think you would do something like uh, if the array dot children or doesn't have it doesn't have children, if it doesn't have any children, you'd do like, you know, toast uh, you know, no such user like that or something, right? And, and then you'd uh, re return. Don't try to process the data if there's nothing in there, OK? You had your hand up. Was that what you were going to ask or something else? Yeah, same, same question. OK, yeah. So this is just me trying to be robust, trying to be a little more careful about what I'm doing here, right? OK. So uh, I can run that again. Let's just make sure we didn't break it. I'm a little scared that maybe we did break it, but <laughs> let's find out. Um, so let's test all three models here. Let's test a name that's not found. Let's test the wrong password, and then let's test the right password real quick. So the name is Marty, and the password is step. Log in. Uh, wrong, the password should, oh, there is a Marty, because I added one. Marty, there. Uh, there's no such user named Marty. OK, I tested that. Now let's do Bart password uh, hello. That's not the right password. It says wrong. The password should have been Bartman. Oh, sorry about that. Bartman. By the way, see how the um, the data, it's printing out the data. It's very helpful to do that. So log in. Great. So we're doing pretty good. The thing that's missing is we are not printing out all of Bart's grades yet. And um, that can you know that can be done in a pretty similar manner. Um, I want to show you something that's kind of cool, though. Uh, about processing this data. So I think what ends up happening is you get really tempted to just pull out the individual pieces of data, like the name as a string and the password as a string or whatever, and you can do that. But I think a really nice way to, to handle the data is to make little objects, little classes that are similar to what you're processing. So like make a little class called student, and a student has an email and an ID and a name and a password, and basically this is just like a really, a data class is just a class that only has fields and no methods. So just a class with some fields in it. So make a class and make the names of these fields exactly correspond to these keys here in the data set. Firebase will allow you to look at the data in terms of as if it were made up of those kind of objects, which I think is sometimes kind of clean and nice. So what you can do is you can say uh, back here, you can say this data, this overall data that I'm pulling children pieces out of, that is kind of the object of the student. So if I go val student equals data dot get value, it allows you to pass in a type. So if I say student class.java, we've used that syntax for intents and stuff, that will return the data as if it were one of these student objects. And I mean, I can just, if I want to be like, if I don't want the nullness stuff, I can use exclamations or question marks or whatever. So now for his name and his password, that's just student dot name and student dot, like now the data is that object. It parsed all of it and put it all into that object for me, which is kind of cool. So you know you might decide you like that better. Student dot password. 
I think it's kind of nice because it's just kind of like you get out of dealing with Firebase crap a little bit earlier in the code. <laughs> now you're just talking to your own classes and your own objects. I kind of like that. Um, but again, a common bug students will have is they'll sort of be off by one level of, is it the child of that? Is it the first child? Is it the whole data? Like I would say people would accidentally call arr.getValue and then it's like trying to turn an array of students into a student object. You know what I mean? So like you have to sort of make sure you're on the right uh, piece of data when you do these conversions or else it'll crash, it'll fail. Um, okay, so like that's kind of the idea. Let's real quickly, I, I think I can do this with the time we have. Um, I want to look up the grades for the student. So like I know I don't want to rush, but I, I think we can do this. So like this is if we actually get logged in and we go over to the other activity, right? So we need the Firebase object. I want to copy some chunk of this because I think it's going to be somewhat similar. Um, let me paste this. So look up the grades for this student. Well, we get the student's table. We, um, wait, we don't want the student's table, do we? We want to query the grades table, right? The grades table is Simpson slash grades. And now within that table, I want all the records that are about this person, that are about Bart or something, right? So let's look at the data again. The grades table has these gibberish keys. But within them, we have these objects that have different things, right? So what what do I want to say in terms of like which of these records do I want to get out? What do you think? Sort by the student ID child, where it's equal to Bart's student ID. That's exactly right. Okay, so so let's do val Bart grades is the grades table ordered by the child student ID equal to ID, the one that is passed into our intent up here. Now, since Firebase is dumb, it doesn't take an int, even though this is an int parameter. You have to ma pass it as a double. Come on, Firebase. Come on, what's up with that? Um, that is going to be an array of all the grade records that are about Bart. Okay? So now we could do Bart grades dot add value listener, and then here on data change, we could do process data again, and maybe we'll pass the data so we can do this we got a few minutes so fun process data the data is a data snapshot well what are we doing with the data um, the data is going to look a little bit like this so it's like an array basically where each array element is one of these grade records now I have remember how we talked about how we have classes for things and stuff so I have a class called grade that's a course it's just one of these data classes and it just corresponds exactly to the rows of that uh, grades table a student ID a course ID a grade all that kind of stuff so if I just loop through the data and turn each chunk of it into one of these guys we can look at it so I think we want something like the following um, for child in the data dot children children let's say val grade equals child dot get value as a grade dot class. Does that make sense? So I'm looping through the elements of the data, whichever ones come back. I convert them into these objects that I like. Now the overall goal here is I want to display the grades to the user. How do I actually get those up on the screen? I don't want to toast them or whatever because there are probably a lot of them. So I want to probably display them as a list. I've got a list view here. So how do I put things into a list view? Remember the old days? An adapter. an adapter. Okay, an adapter takes an array or a list, right? We can do this. So val list equals an array list of strings. For each of these grades, I'll say list.add. You got a grade of um, grade dot grade plus in plus grade dot course name. So you got a B in CSC, whatever. You got a C in this. Just like add a string to the, oh, it's uh, needs me to be New York about it. So at the end of this code, I got a list of grades. So what's the name of the list in the code here? It's called uh, grade list. So I'll say grade, grade list dot adapter is a, an array adapter of strings. Remember this stuff? It takes three parameters. It takes 
this and some layout thingy, android.r.layout.simplelistitem1. <laughs> and then it takes the list, doesn't it? Maybe? Do we have any confidence at all that this could possibly work? I have no faith in myself. Let's run it and see. I will not make you stay <laughs> until it works, because <laughs> we're almost out of time. Uh, Bart, Bart man. OMG, right? Yay. It's very quiet applause. Yeah. Now wait. I have one more cool thing I want to show you, and I know it's time to go. But so I mean those are Bart's grades. It really did look them up in the database. But one of the things that, that if the marketing person come, came back in for the last minute of class, they would say that another cool thing about Firebase is that not only does this code go and fetch that data, but it continues to watch the data. So if the data were to change, and someone decided that BART were graded unfairly. The app would just update like that. That's kind of cool, isn't it? I didn't change anything. It just beamed the new data back and redrew the list. That's really fun. So Firebase is kind of cool. I know it's a little tricky, but there you go. OK, well, I'm out of time. So have a delightful day. Go to your sections today and tomorrow. And we'll see you again on Thursday. Thanks.